it's a very emotional time to be in law enforcement as a black man. Interesting time to be a black man in America because you're always a black man first. So even though as a law enforcement officer, you know that what the media, what the news, what people are saying is not always completely the truth. They're flashing these images at you constantly and you start to look at it and say, wow, there is another deceased black man at the hands of the police. So as a black man, you, you get very conflicted as to what your job is and how to handle it. As a law enforcement officer, you look at it and say, certain situations might be okay. You know, you look at the specific one in Atlanta where, you know, the bad guy took a taser and fired at the cops and everybody lost their mind. And you look at it from a law enforcement perspective and say, it's how we're trained. But then you look at it again, it becomes another dead black man who could be you. And then you get angry inside because you're saying, that's not the way the majority of law enforcement works. That's not the way that the majority of law enforcement is trained. There are bad apples, yes, but it's not who we are. Shots rang out and two of our officers were shot. Relax. Man, I can't breathe my face. Just get up. Ugh. Ugh. What do you want? I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't Blake, say his name, say his name, say his name. There are two systems of justice in the United States. There's a white system and there's a black system. Now, there may be debate as to whether this was an appropriate use of deadly force. I firmly believe that there is a clear distinction between what you can do and what you should do. Law enforcement is held to a high standard, and we should be held to a high standard, and we, we're closely scrutinized. But our deputies and law enforcement officers across our country are dealing with some big challenges day in and day out. These folks are laying their lives on the line for total strangers. They're willing to give up their lives for people they don't even know. And then when you think about what they have to deal with each day, uh, until you've walked in their shoes and, and heard it straight from them, from people who are experiencing what it's like uh, to be an African-American police officer or deputy and working day in and day out in a noble career and profession and with a heartbeat for people and wanting to make a difference, 
But at the same time, you're feeling the pressures. They're feeling the pressures from others uh, to get out of the profession. We need you in this profession. We need you to be a part of the solution. The national perspective and the national issues do not necessarily represent Stafford. They don't represent where we are. I know that our police force has been well-trained. I know that from the, my relationship with the sheriff and what he stands for, that the culture that he sets is inclusive and it is not um, divisive. There's a danger in taking national issues and localizing them, especially in an area where you don't think there's a problem. When these situations happen, we have to challenge them. We have to address them. We have to be forceful in making sure that those things don't represent our area or our police force or our subset. We have to hold each other accountable. Stafford County consists of 277 square miles. We're positioned about 45, 50 miles um, south of Washington, D.C., the capital of uh, the United States. So we have about 153,000 people living in Stafford, and Stafford is the third fastest growing county in the Commonwealth of Virginia. It attracts a lot of people um, because it's a great county to live in, great schools. So our department is about 286 personnel, and 209 of those folks are sworn deputies. Lee Peters, he is a man of integrity. Uh, he cares about the community. He cares about Stafford County. He gives of his time and energy mentoring the youth. Um, he's a leader in our department. People look up to him. And he cares deeply about our community. My father uh, was in law enforcement before me, and it's one of the reasons that I wanted to get in law enforcement. He was one of the first two African-American men to graduate the Ohio State Police Academy. Watching the pictures and seeing my dad in uniform, and um, he was a Marine just like I was, and I kind of followed his footsteps into, into law enforcement. So Captain Lee Peters is probably the definition of standards and integrity. He holds the standard when the standard is heavy and hard to hold. So in 2016, I was promoted to lieutenant, which made me the first African-American command staff member in the history of Stafford County. Two years ago in December, I was promoted to the rank of captain. And I became the first you know, person of color to command a division within the Stafford County Sheriff's Office. When you looked around when I got here, being one of the only African Americans in the department, and there was a time when I was the only African American on patrol, you know, there, there's nothing to look up to. To break that ceiling, people are looking up to you because they now think that they can get to that point or they know somebody can get to that point. It's a, it's a great experience and it's a great feeling. Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Don't shoot! I also don't like the fact that we are importing a problem from 3,000 miles away into my community, into my state, and now we're expected to solve it. We didn't do this. We, we didn't do what's on the news. We're not Atlanta, we're not Minneapolis, we're not anywhere except for Stafford County where I can affect change. You know, I remember, you know, standing on, on the bridge before the protests happened, looking at, looking at young black kids looking him in the eye saying, please, let's not do this. Let's, let's not do this, please. Let's, let's go over here and talk, please, let's talk. You know what's about to happen next, you know, trained police officer, I know what comes next. You know, people in riot gear show up, tear gas gets shot, and you know how this movie ends. But you're looking at these kids going, this is not the way to make change. It's not how you do it. And you, you see, you know, all this going on. And again, there's this internal tornado in your brain that just starts spinning and you don't know what to do or, or what to say. Deputy John Herod, he's a man of strong faith and strong conviction. Uh, he's very supportive and thoughtful and he's a grateful person. He's honest and authentic and very compassionate. Uh, he's a peacemaker. He helps people through difficult situations and he, he's a force for good. My father was a police officer for over 30 years. He actually retired as a narcotics detective. And to see the difference that he made in the community, it just motivated and inspired me to, to want to do the same thing. When he went through the whole process of trying to uh, get into being a police officer, 
no after no after no after no. I kind of felt like if it were me, I would have just gave up and said, I'm, I'm not going to do this. Like, it's just not for me. But he kept pushing. His persistent to keep fighting for what he wants and what he believes in really, really inspires me. I, I'll never forget it when he finally got it and he was like, I got in. They, get, they, they accepted me. I'm going to be a police officer. I was like, really? And he was like, yeah. I, it was amazing to see his, the face, the tears, the smile, everything. It was amazing. The reason why Sheriff D.P. Decatur is my hero is because he allowed me to come into law enforcement with no experience, but he saw something in me that nobody else did. He gave me an opportunity to learn and to grow and to make a difference. He's such a good man and he has such a strong faith. There has been a lot of injustice. There has been a lot of racism. There has been a lot of actions that have happened that I feel are not justified. It hurts and it hurts a lot. As a black man in law enforcement, it hurts even more because I feel that I see both sides. I feel that there's a lot of conflicts that arise in my head and in my heart because of what is happening in America today. You're a piece of shit. You're a piece of shit. You really are. Deputy Ron Richmond, he's a leader and a mentor He's strong, but he's a gentle, kind spirit. Uh, he cares about the youth, and he's a great mentor for our youth and our students in Stafford County. He has strong convictions, and he, he stands for what he believes in, and he's a devoted family man. I come from, from a family where I have a, a brother and a sister. My sister is um, in law enforcement currently out in San Diego, California. She's a detective. She started out as a sheriff's department working in jails and then switched over to the police department, worked the road, and now she's a, she's a detective um, coming up on almost 25 years. And my brother, he's a retired corrections officer, and he started off, um, you know, being a regular uh, probation officer and then retired being in charge of one of the um, central districts uh, with probation officers, so they understand law enforcement. Of course, he loves his wife, he loves his children, and he loves his job, and he loves to mentor others. He's really proud to tell somebody or to me that he helps someone. The riotings and, and the way society has taken a different view towards us in law enforcement, it's had a big effect because I no longer am a person. Now I'm a thing. And what I mean by a thing, a thing that wears a badge and that is a monster out there wanting to hurt everybody, and the majority of the opinions of, of the public that I deal with. You take that book, you're nothing! You're nothing! You're nothing! You're nothing. I do believe, whether, whether it's badge or not, people have a right to, to their opinion, and they have a right to speak. Being called the names that I was called, being called Uncle Tom, and being called, you know, you're a pig, and people walk right past you and throw the finger at you and say things to you, which they wouldn't have did that several months ago. They didn't have that type of attitude towards the badge. That's what hurts the most, because that's not the case. If I say all police officers are bad, I'm wrong. If I say all black people are thugs, I'm wrong. If I say all white people are racist, I'm wrong. That generalization has some kind of way crept into the political aspects and the dialogue that is, is being pushed every day every single day. Most of these situations represent a very small population of activity that we've overgeneralized to encompass an entire people. You're saying that black people deserve a chance to advance unless you're a cop. Lives matter, black lives, black people. Everyone deserves to grow up happy and healthy unless you're a cop. We want equality, we want justice. We want to be able to pursue any career without being looked at as another black person that holds true unless you're in law enforcement right now. There is no way as black people we will ever grow until we do things like we say we want them done to us. Sergeant Carol Burgess, she's a caring and compassionate person who cares so much about our community. Uh, she has this great smile. She has this great ability to communicate with people, bringing people together. She's a great mother and she works well with people. And she's that person that people in our community just love. 
Well, my husband, um, he's with Arlington Sheriff's Office, um, and my youngest son is 27 years old. He's a, a police officer. I am the only black female deputy in Stafford County Sheriff's Office of an agency of about 220 sworn officers. It's a struggle every day, I would say. We, as black and as just women officers, we have so much more to offer. And that's kind of made me want to be in the uniform even more or be in this field more so I can be that role model. Carol. Burgess is one of the people who no matter what I have going on with youth, if I call on her, she comes. She supports our efforts. She communicates. She has a relationship with young people and she has a, a genuine care for communicating and working with young people. Um, so just not only being a black woman in law enforcement, but just being a woman and just knowing what she has to deal with. The minority count isn't as high in her agency as it is in Arlington. The diversity level isn't as high. So she's had some rough times there. Just, just seeing her fight through that and not really share it early on in her career. And I mean, I think these last five years, we really started to talk about that more with everything going on. I was in a marked vehicle. I was going to the sheriff's office to work out and I had on a pink tank top um, driving, you know, cause we drive our vehicles and, you know, headed to the gym to work out. Um, somebody called and, you know, I was on the computer and they thought, they didn't think I was a law enforcement officer because I'm black driving a Mark Cruiser, really? Um, so that that's kind of tough because I guess they don't expect to see black females in this field. And when I'm not in uniform, that's like a, a, a whole nother story. For me, it's about protecting and serving those that can't speak for themselves. It's, it's That's what it's about. It's about helping the community. My goal is not to go out here and hurt people, it's to go out and help people. So when you say that to me, I'm here for you. If you're a victim, then guess what? I'm here for you. I'm here to help you. If you don't know an officer, get to know an officer because there's more to it than this uniform. Don't look at just this uniform that we wear or the badge, but look at that person um, because we are human. We are mothers. And again, first, I'm a black woman. I'm a woman because again, you see the uniform and that's all people see. And, and they devalue you as a person. And it's like, you don't even know me. I hope all of your children get raped and killed. It feels like you're loved on one half of the spectrum, but on the other half, you're hated just because you are a law enforcement officer as a black man. And I just feel that that burden has a weight that's indescribable a minority police officer responding to not just a protest, but any minority incident puts them in a place where they feel a certain kind of way. Whether it's, I'm being called a traitor, I, I'm being called, I'm not black anymore because I wear the uniform. There's all kinds of experiences and feelings tied to those experiences that they are um, going through. When people say that I've sold out and I'm working for the white man, what, what I would say to you is every day that I put this uniform on, you don't know me as a person. I am first a black woman because that's the first thing that you see. Just because I'm white and I haven't experienced racism myself doesn't mean I can't fight for justice. They're a part of the system. They're a part of the problem. Just because they're black doesn't mean they're not a part of the problem. I'm allowed to say this to whoever. I was once talking to a parent. A white male said, um, hey, I want to ask you a question. I was having a conversation with my son, and my son said, well, Dad, you don't understand um, the, the difficulties of Black people. And he said, son, neither do you. Lieutenant Deontay Diggs, he is a leader in our organization, and he's a leader in our community. Uh, he is a fun-loving, caring, gregarious guy who just uh, cares about people. He's a mentor. He's very supportive. Uh, he's a patient person, and uh, he's somebody who's very committed to community engagement. Uh, it's important to him that we have a uh, strong relationship between our organization and the citizens of Stafford County. I never had any intentions of becoming a law enforcement officer based off of how I was raised. It was a just a drug-infested environment as a child from my earliest memories up until I turned 13. Starvation, 
molestation, domestic abuse, just a lot of different trauma. Growing up in that environment, we were taught, you know, what happens in this house stays in this house. You don't contact law enforcement. Um, you take care of matters on your own. And so I went into law enforcement with a lot of fear um, based off of how I was raised. And as a black man who happens to be gay serving in law enforcement, you know, it, it's kind of like a, a, a double whammy. You never know um, how you're gonna be accepted going into, into spaces. And so typically if uh, people are okay with your race, then there's an issue with your sexuality. And if they're not okay with your race, then you throw the sexuality piece in there, it makes it more difficult. I mean, he even likes being labeled as the gay police officer, because that's part of his diversity too. It's identity, and I know that he's proud of it. I know that he can separate it, but it's hard sometimes, depending on the lens that you're looking through. One of my first sergeants now um, spoke about being in a roll call where a supervisor came in and said, you know, hey, we have a gay deputy that we've hired and used a few, you know, slurs or whatever, um, and couldn't believe that, you know, the sheriff's office had, had hired a gay guy. There were some conversations about, you know, not being in the locker room. When people were changing, I had, um, you know, some, some peers that would say stuff like, I love you, but, um, I'm worried about your internal destination and, and those types of things. So I struggled with that. But there's always going to be those negative comments made. We were walking downtown a couple months ago, holding hands. And a car um, came through and they yelled faggots. We just kept walking and we kept talking and we ignored it. I'm very proud to say that I have a husband. I'm so proud to say that I'm married to Deontay Diggs. Uh, but I, I know that people can be uncomfortable with that. I've been called an Uncle Tom more times than I can count. Porch monkey and, and all of those types of things. I've actually had it on both sides. I, you know, I've been called a nigger while being in uniform. I've been told, you know, um, you're a good color. For some reason, given where we are currently as a nation and, and everything that's going on, things like that hurt now more so than they did in the beginning of my career. And I think part of that is because as a black man, period, I'm just so worn down by everything that's going on around me. I think that's why it's, it's more impactful now to hear those types of things or to see those images. I have lost about 85% of my friends and have been shunned by a large portion of my family because I've decided to go into law enforcement. But deep down inside, it's okay. Because I didn't choose this profession to be liked. I chose this profession to help. Bishop Leonard Lacey, he's a strong man of faith. He's a compassionate person who is calm and has a peaceful spirit as our chaplain and a retired police officer. He brings a lot of experience and knowledge and wisdom to our department. He's a community leader and a mentor who people look up to, and he's a man of integrity and strong character. Currently, I'm serving as a chaplain in a volunteer position with the Stafford Sheriff Department. I was born and raised in the state of Alabama, moved to Virginia in 1970. I uh, have uh, a wife that's deceased now. We have uh, three children. Um, pastor here locally in Stafford County as well. Um, been a part of Stafford when I got here, assigned in 1976. Uh, so it's just been a community for me. Uh, when I moved from the state of Alabama, I felt that I would be getting away from racism. I've seen Klan march up in the thousand. Uh, we've seen, uh, we even had a small cross burn in our yard. Uh, moved to Virginia and I said, finally, I will get away from racism, only to find racism be even more grand here in the state of Virginia. It's hidden at times, but then sometimes it's just right in your face and you're trying to adjust to it and become the best person you can in the, in the midst of it. Being in law enforcement, I worked on the cover for a period of time, um, became uh, a trooper, as I mentioned earlier, and even being stopped. And even today, it's uh, it's kind of a reminder as well, dealing with my grandboys. I have four grandchildren. Uh, two of them are adults, and some challenges that they have gone through caused me to have to go back and rethink. I, I felt like I would make a difference in law enforcement when I was involved, uh, you know, full time. 
only to realize it seemed like we'd gone full circle and we got to start all over again. I have felt that I was not appreciated. You know, you go to help a person, no matter what color they are, but it hurts even more that you're trying to help people of color. And as a result of that, um, you know, you're getting belittled. Um, you are, um, you are the man, you working for the man. There you go again, every black guy selling drugs. It, it does, it does hurt. When you're there to try and protect people and help people, and you're there to do nothing but do what your job is and probably a little bit more to help people out, it, it stings. It's, um, you wonder why you're doing it. And then you get angry. Like there have been moments where I'll find a, a hiding spot somewhere while I'm in my patrol vehicle and I'll just cry. Because sometimes it's hard to express what you're feeling when you have to wear that hat as a law enforcement officer. Because you can feel whatever you want to feel, but sometimes you can't say. Oftentimes people um, will put you to the side um, just because you're wearing the uniform. You're no longer black at that point. Um, your life doesn't matter. And that's the, the hardest part. You know, if, if I go out today and I get killed, it doesn't matter whether it was a white person or, or what their ethnicity is. Nobody cares about that. That's my best friend right there. And it's hard. So, but you get through it and you, you know, I'm a positive person. And, uh, you know, I called him today and I said, please be safe because it just bothers me, uh, you know, of him going out and doing the line of work that he does. I know he's helping people, but it's like, you never know who's gonna, who's gonna bother him, who's gonna go against him, you know, who, who's gonna hurt him just because he wears that badge. Detective Aaron Dupree, he's a humorous, friendly, and fun-loving guy. He's gregarious, affable. He has a great smile. People gravitate to him. He's resilient and hardworking. And as a detective, uh, he cares so deeply about victims of crimes. He's a great team player, and he stands up for what he believes in. I started in law enforcement in 2012 with Stafford County. I'm married. I have three kids. We love each other. We have fun. We love God. We go to church. We do family and we do life. Growing up, it was cool. Like, yeah, my dad's a police officer. Like, my friends would ask, like, what does he like? Does he like kill people? Like, no, he doesn't do that. But, but he's, 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 it's really fun growing up, but it's also scary because you see, like, the news and you see that things that the police officers are doing. And it's like, my, my dad's not like that. He, he's like a different kind of, he's the good cop. He's the good, he's the good dude. I'd be a little scared to be a white cop right now and have to deal with an African-American person. I, I would be scared for that cop being black because you got a judgment call to make before you pull the trigger or before you take someone. Th that's something that's got to process through your mind. I guarantee you a white deputy rolled up on scene and this is domestic when it's crazy. It's got to run through his head and they say something about the, the victim or the suspects or the household being black. Something's got to run through your mind that makes you take another step of caution. But that another step of caution could get you killed. I can be angry, not sin. I can cry on the inside and smile on the outside and go home and hide my face. And that's what happens in law enforcement. And I believe that our law enforcement are sensitive to those things. How can you not respect the sacrifice and the effort of that group. Not to say that their sacrifice is any greater than their counterpart as a, a white officer, but what it is saying is they carry a, an additional burden of representing the entire minority population even while they're policing that same minority population. That's, that's gotta be tough. That's gotta be hard. That's gotta be something that we bring attention to and monitor. What drains me is the attack on the profession as a whole, the damage that's being done, because I've been doing a lot of work to try to change it, to, to diversify it, to bring more people of color in. It's almost at a point where it kind of weighs you down. I can't change people. I can't change their perception. And a lot of times it is just about the perception. The most difficult challenge that I face as a black man in law enforcement is some of the encounters with other black people. They don't understand 
that I don't stand for injustice either. I don't stand for racism either. I don't stand for police brutality either. And when I have these encounters and I'm put in that box, sometimes it feels like you can't get out. I haven't given up hope, I can tell you that. I just, I just know that I have to be prepared every time that I interact with somebody that the first thing that may come out of their mouth is a negative thing, not a positive thing. Oh, are we really saying we, we, blue lives don't matter? I don't think that's what they're saying. They're just saying that there are some law enforcement that has taken up on themselves to be the judge and jury of everything when it's not the case. And I believe that for a person to hear, the right messenger's got to carry the message. Minorities in our um, organization are very important to us. And I think we just need to, to listen and be present and, and try to have empathy and to understand what is it like to be in their shoes. Um, coming to this department and again, being very isolated, not having peers or mentors in law enforcement who understand me or you know the culture of black people. It was, it was very lonely. And sometimes even now being you know, the only division commander, you, you don't have anybody to bounce things off of. If something happens in law enforcement right now and it affects you, like you look at the news or you look at any topic that goes on that's hurtful either to you as a police officer or a black male, if I look around the department right now, there's no one to confide in because no one understands how these things affect a black man. There have been times where it's been very, very joyous because race and color, creed didn't matter. It wasn't on the national stage. But when it comes back to the national stage and you have to look at what's going on and you have to be a professional police officer and you have to kind of let all those things go and the department expects you to compartmentalize those things. They, you know, you can't just come in and say, you know, I'm angry about what's going on in the world because, you know, as a black man, I'm hurt. You can't do that. So you have to find other ways and other people to vent to or to talk to, because if I go into an office with a white male, it just seems, and it comes off as just anger. It comes off as, why do you feel this way? You know, we're a good department or we're a good agency or we're good people. Why are you angry at us? Well, well I'm, I'm not. I'm angry because of what I'm seeing and how I feel. And you really have to put that away while you're working and while you're at the office. So it becomes very, very stressful. And then if you do react, it, it becomes this issue of what's wrong with you? It is very often that the, uh, the demographic of the population that's being policed is not, um, is not represented in those forces. Diversity is very important to our department because we want to be a reflection. We want to mirror our community. And in order for us to um, have a strong partnership uh, with the community, in order to collaborate and work together, um, all of that is built on the foundation of trust. And when you look into a law enforcement organization from the perspective of the community and you see a reflection of you, someone who looks like you, someone who comes maybe from your culture, someone who um, can, can connect and understand that's very important. And uh, having diversity, um, it really helps out a great deal. You look around and you're like, man, there's not a lot of diversity here. You may have personality conflicts, so that dwindles the numbers down even further as far as who you can relate to, who you can talk to. And so oftentimes there's a lack of trust. You have people like Captain Peters, who's upstairs in command. And, and as I'm looking to him to achieve something like that, the people in patrol are looking to me to achieve something like that. And it's a ripple effect of what we're supposed to do. And then have a kind heart to know you don't deserve it just because you're black. And I tell my kids all the time, you don't get something just because the color of your skin. If you don't deserve it, you don't deserve it. Mentorship is an opportunity that people should seek. I have had the opportunity to mentor some people um, just dealing with the unrest, the social unrest that's going on right now. You know, I was in the Wawa and had a camera conversation with a lady and her son about, you know, he was scared of the police for some reason. You know, she had a pretty open mind and, you know, we got to, to talk and I got to talk to him and hear some of his views and understand why he felt the way he did. And, 
you know, he got to see me as, as a person that was, you know, he, he saw me as a person wearing that uniform instead of the uniform, you know, wearing a person. Well, having less people of color in positions of mentorship and guidance, and it, it leads to where we've been. It leads to 20 years ago. It leads to kids being uncertain about their future. It, it leads to kids not knowing that they can accomplish more than what's in their neighborhood. You know, one of the big things that you, you want is you want to show young people that there's more to life than what you've grown up with. Men of color or women of color or anybody who's like that person who lives in that particular neighborhood, it just means so much to draw them out to something that might be better. You know, we're not saying that, you know, everything that's going on is, is a horrible situation, but there is so much more to the world than what has happened in your neighborhood or your house. What we're going through in our country and the polarization that we're experiencing, whether it's through race, or whether it's through, you know, political divide or other social issues, um, it creates a big challenge for us. It's, it's hard enough to um, attract um, a diverse um, uh, group of people into into law enforcement, but right now with the, the climate in our country, um, it makes it even more difficult. There is such a taboo within minority environments about becoming a police officer. It hinders any recruitment efforts. There's this sense that once you put on the uniform, you are no longer a black person or care about black people. And not only is that not true, but I do believe it has a direct correlation to the lack of recruitment in those minority communities. There's a way for us to, one, understand that, and then what we need to do is come up with efforts that change the perspective and the interpretation and the representation of minorities um, that wear the uniform. The challenge for us is attracting minorities. And the one thing that we refuse to do is deviate um, from our from our standard. It's important. We owe it to the community. We owe it to our profession. We owe it to ourselves to make sure that we hire the best people possible that we can. What is your hiring process like? What are your recruiting processes like? That cannot stay the same. If this community is changing and your sheriff's office or your law enforcement agencies aren't, of course you're going to have like big differences when things like George Floyd happen because that understanding will not be there. You have to get with people that can identify with you. We try to be innovative using technology, whether it's videos, whether it's um, going physically, uh, using our recruitment recruiters to go to these different locations, like the colleges consist of predominantly African-American students. Also going out of the state, we, we go outside the boundaries of Virginia to try to recruit as well. Um, because we keep um, pitting race against police and police against race. So for me, I don't want to be a police officer, um, but on the other side is police don't get enough money. Why do I want to put my knife on the line to go out here, protect somebody that may end up walking up on me in the dark and shooting me? So it's not worth it. It's, it's a number of reasons. Can we do anything to soften that number and make it open? As a result of the rhetoric and what we're seeing on the media and the push to um, silence um, law enforcement officers, voices who happen to be black, is that you're gonna see the diversity dwindle in law enforcement because a lot of minorities don't wanna go in law enforcement anymore. I'd love to see more officers of color. Uh, I've, on my own, tried to recruit young African-Americans to take up the challenge and, and, and put on the uniform and the badge because we were at this pivot point to where Society is making it look like or the, you're either on their side or you're on my side. If we don't do something to change the way law enforcement's looked at and the way it's dealt with um, in a positive way, we're going to turn away a lot of potential people to have, have the opportunity to be good people in uniform. So if you're trying to make a difference for minority people, then become a police officer. Hold the standard change the perspective, be the person that goes back into your communities and shows that you being a police officer doesn't exclude you from being black. If anything, it puts me in a position where I have some authority to be impactful, to protect and serve like we're called to do. Let my badge represent my care for people. Race never came in my 
my head in nothing that I did with law enforcement. And that is what is a challenge to me in seeing law enforcement today. Why does race play a part? What is racist? Like, what is like, what is a racist? To me, it's just one race um, belittling, putting down another race, one race thinking they are superior to another. To me, that's racism. In many cases, there's racism going on within your culture as well. But all of those racism comes out of some experiences, I believe, or teachings that we have that we don't want to face. Racism is a level of hate. But if you're making a comment based off of what you think a race is like, then I'm not sure if that's racism. But if I make a comment of straight hate and it's a continued pa a pattern of hate for a certain culture, or race, that's where we have to make sure that we listen and don't respond too quick. Because it's quick for us to say, oh, he's a racist. What, 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 what did he do that was hateful? Did he speak out of ignorance? Yeah. Does he speak out of ignorance a lot? Yeah. Does he really hate black people or does he doesn't, doesn't understand it? He's responding out of ignorance. And that's why you gotta be, Bible says, quick to listen and slow to speak. I think we have to do a better job with weeding out the the ones that are racist and who are promoting racism, because it's there. I've worked with people who had um, implicit bias. And so those implicit bias, they can affect how people approach things and, and what they say. And so sometimes it's not that people are racist, they're just uninformed or un uneducated. And so some of the things that they say can be offensive and they don't even realize it. I have been in situations where a lot of insensitivity has occurred. My lieutenant and I, we were rehearsing We Shall Overcome as a potential to sing. While we were rehearsing in the stairwell, there were two law enforcement officers that entered into that stairwell to go up. One of them opened up their mouth and said, uh, you already overcame. And that really just did not sit well at all. Because there were a couple of people that I felt that because of the color of my skin, that didn't care for me and they, you know, didn't speak to me, wouldn't open their mouth, wouldn't, I was like, real? Like, I'm, I'm always this, hey, how you doing type of person. Working with racist cops is I can't respond too quick. I have to listen. I have to have reason and evidence to say something like that. I think it needs to be checked early. I wouldn't say they need to be fired off the back because they just need to be educated, you know, black and white. There's a zero tolerance. Will not stand for it. Will not be allowed you'll be terminated. You're fighting within yourself, you're fighting within your agency to make sure that there's inclusion and there's diversity, and then you have to fight the people that look like you out in the community. And your voice is being diminished on so many different levels just because of the uniform. If we all just turn inwardly and deal with our own biases and then begin to deal with that, you have to face the reality. It hurts because that's what my job is as a chaplain, that's what my job is as a pastor. It's just trying to get people to understand there is a better way than what we're doing. But the problem is nobody seems to want to listen. We don't need uh, anybody else to get shot before we recognize we have a problem. And I had a young man walk up to me in the Wawa and I got, was getting some coffee. And the first thing out of his mouth was, I know that y'all have a problem with people of color, but I want to ask you a question. And I looked at him and I'm like, what would make you say something like that? The way he said it, and you could tell that he was angry, but he tried to do it politely, but he was angry. And I asked him, I said, what is the difference between a black person hating a white person and a white person hating a black person? What is the difference? Hate is hate. It doesn't know a color. I've worked with officers who may not be racist, but may not have an understanding of how their words affect other people. I've tried to talk to those people. I've tried to, at certain points, distance myself from them. It's a scary endeavor to know that you have somebody out there with a badge and a gun whose job is to go out and protect everybody who does not like certain segments. But this whole thing, this narrative that, you know, cops are out here hunting black people, it's just a false narrative. Cultural diversity within any organization is important to the advancement and the understanding uh, or the execution of the goals of the organization. But the number one issue facing law enforcement is not racism. It's communication, it's empathy, it's de-escalation, and it's training on your implicit bias. I know here in Stafford, a 
wonderful training complex has been built built within the sheriff's department. And I have practiced on their uh, digital virtual environment. I, I've seen it, it's amazing. It puts you in um, uh, situations that you can train on, whether it's school shootings, whether it's uh, home invasions or just target practice. You know, I've, I've played with it. And I think that is a very, accurate and, and, and useful mechanism. So uh, this simulator behind me um, gives me the option in, in several different scenarios to change the race of the suspect, right? So if I thought that for a second, I can, I can put them on the spot and there's no better way, right? To test someone's gut reaction than to put them on the spot, put them under stress, their heart rate's elevated, right? and they're, they're, they're more likely to make a, a decision, like a split second decision in this scenario. And I can tell you that the race just does not play a factor. They're trying to practice uh, to preserve their own life or someone else's. It would just be amazing to me to, to be able to see somebody who, who was taking that a race in, into that as a factor. The factor is, right, is this person gonna kill me? Or is they, are they trying to kill somebody else? Is there something that I can do about it? Wow. Skin color? White male, about uh, maybe 5'8", okay. 10 coat on top. On top. Okay. How about the car? you remember anything about the car? Oh, shit. It looked like a brown trailblazer. Okay. I was trying to remember all of it. Cultural diversity is very important to law enforcement and to our organization. The training is very important. It's so important that we're mandated by the state of Virginia to train on it at least every other year, but we train by policy, our own policy, we train every year. Within the Sheriff's Department or within business, one of the greatest tools we have is friendship. And I know that sounds very simple. When you have friends that don't look like you or don't have your same experiences, you have an environment where you can have very friendly conversations. I feel that racism is a key component to what's plaguing law enforcement because it is being pushed without an answer. Do I believe that there's racism in law enforcement? I do, because I've experienced it before. But by no means do I feel that all cops are racist, especially white ones. So I feel that if racism is becoming the downfall of law enforcement, let us answer. And I would agree that there are some cops out here that should not be cops, but that's not who I am. And there are many law enforcement officers who that is not who they are. It's crazy to think that law enforcement would ever go away because law enforcement is here to stay. We have to have police to protect our communities and protect our country. I've heard people say, well, take money away from the police, put more counselors in school. That's wonderful, wonderful concept. But if that counselor in school does not have a heart or understand the people of color, you just got another counselor in school putting out the same thing you have. So I think we have to go a little bit more than just saying things. So having a community partnership, that's what I love about Staff Recruit. I love the position I'm in right now because it's like you're bringing the community as part of the sheriff's office and these business partners, you know, they jump on board like G3 did and say, hey, wh what is it that you need? And, and they're all about it because we're out in the community and we're working as one. So that's the beauty of it. You got the community, the schools, and then your business partners um, and the sheriff's office. And that's what, it, that's like what it's all about. G3 Community Services is a 501c3 nonprofit. We're based out of Stafford, Virginia. We do a number of things to benefit the community um, from feeding community meals to education in partnership with the Stafford County Public School System. Anywhere that we identify a need, even if it's from rental assistance all the way to um, helping people get employed. G3CS has a great relationship with the local law enforcement here in Stafford. We have had officers come and volunteer at our events. We have them mentor at our Extraordinary Young Minds program. We've even been a part of delivering Thanksgiving and holiday um, and Christmas meals with them, as well as last year, we gave out over 150 Christmas presents to uh, families with children in need and high-risk children. We have an incredible relationship 
with our schools, with our school superintendent, with the school board and all the school officials. And we work together. You know, we have a school safety task force um, that is comprised of, of members from the schools and the sheriff's office. It would absolutely be a detriment to remove SROs from schools. They build that community of partnership with all of our kids. They build relationships and that's the biggest thing I think any of us could ask for in, in schools or communities. You wanna build relationships, you wanna know your people. And that's, that's the one way we educate each other, our students, and we just have a successful community. I've been doing the SRO job for many years now, and I've gone from devil, several different types of high school. This is actually my third high school that I've, I've actually served at. Um, if it's, a, if it's a, a white kid or a black kid or, 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 or whatever, the connection that I've made with them and being able to answer their questions and deal with them directly and be honest with them about what life offers to them and what they can do, I think they connect with me well and, uh, and I'm a strong inspiration for them to, to do good and to make choices which is gonna um, carry on in their, in their lifetime. I'll tell you, I had a meeting just a couple of days ago with our future SRO and his vision of working with counselors. It's just how their lens that they look through. It's not that prison pipeline that people talk about because there's a huge concern over that, but you want an SRO in the building that's gonna build partnerships with the students, build relationships with students that shows that law enforcement has a positive side. They're here for a reason. I understanding there are some things that just can't be avoided. Like if a child brings a gun to school, absolutely, there are gonna be repercussions. If children get into a fight, which often happens in school, do we want that to turn into assault charges for our students? I, I'm, I'm not sure that we want that. I'm not sure we wanna mark a high school fight as a, as a legal issue that's going to mark that student for the rest of their life. I'm not sure we want to do that. And I think the students that go to Mountain View that have been here for a year or two that have gotten to know me, or even from word of mouth from other ones, is that I'm someone they can trust and that, that I care about helping them more than I care about putting them in the system. I know a lot of parents fear of having police officers in the schools that we're going to arrest their kid and their kid's going to be in the system. but. That's not the goal of SROs. The SRO, and I think the impression that I've given with schools in the past that I've been at and had to leave and they were upset because I, I was being put in a different school or whatever, is that connection to where they know that my first intention is to take care of them and not to arrest them or ruin their, their reputation or future. In my opinion, the importance of having a resource officer at our schools is everything. So they build relationship with students, um, they discuss, um, preventative measures. So if we're looking at discipline, they talk to them about um, their actions and what could happen, but then they also educate them. So that's the biggest piece for me is just um, educating students and making sure that we know the full impact of one's decisions um, and where it gets us. So our, our goals and our partnerships together is getting our students to graduate. And it's been so helpful having a, a resource officer making that um, making that connection with students with us. So what law enforcement, what SROs, what DARE officers bring to the table is building that relationship with those kids, building that foundation. And I would just hate to see that go away because there's truly, truly a lot of us out there who love kids and, and want to see, I mean, when we see them, you know, grow up to be adults and, and doing great things and then still having that connection. Deputy Sergeant Burgess, she was my high school uh, officer and she was phenomenal. Um, everybody loved her. She impacted and changed my life in so many ways. I was kind of the trouble kid back in high school. So she kind of, you know, took the time to talk to me, understand me, um, figure out what was going on with me and uh, put me on a better path to be the woman that I am today. I, I would like to think that she actually helped mold me and create me to the woman that I am today. Um, when these kids see me for the young black girls and young black boys, our, you know, Hispanic kids, you know, for them, and I've heard them say this, when they see me in uniform and they look and it's like, okay, I can do that. So, and we, I feel the same way when I see another black female 
um, you know, in uniform. I'm like, okay, we kind of get a like, all right, you know, that's inspire, inspiring. So and that's what I want to do. So it's like, we always want to see somebody that look like us and you see them in a positive role. And it's like, wow, I can do that. If you remove me from the schools, I feel like that's a part that, you know, we'll be losing. Places in rural Stafford that I would probably never visit myself. I've seen gentlemen and me being biased, you know, to, to some degree, I've seen gentlemen walk up to my wife who she's had some dealing with their kids or grandkids if they're the foster parent and come up to him and give him a hug. And I'm like, wow. And I'm talking about these guys in backwards country, I'm like, hey, what is, what is this about? And just thanking her because their kids went home to say, you know what, Miss Burgess didn't get me expelled today or she didn't kick, get me kicked out of school. She hugged me, she bought me lunch. And from there on, I knew she cared for me. I've done more court cases that the outcome is where the kid was given the opportunity to prove themselves over a year's time. And then it came back up for um, review and then the case was dismissed. And I think kids know that I'm the type of person that will hold them to a certain standard that the law says they will, but I'll also turn around and bat for them to do the right thing and, and, and have a break. Deputy Richmond was the school resource officer at my son's middle school and now high school at Mountain View High School in Stafford County. Um, I have no idea as a parent what we would do without him as a resource. He provides the kids with um, security. He's, you know, doing amazing things for the community. There's things that have happened that he's been able to prevent. I like having a resource officer there because the thought that if anything happens, especially within today's climate, it's nice to know that there's someone there that has the resources to stop something. We've had problems before where he's been there and he's helped de-escalate things. For me as a student, it feels a lot better knowing that there's someone there to stop stuff if anything happens. If they're doing the job the right way, um, they're building those relationships with, with the students, with the teachers, and through those relationships, and that rapport, you receive information, and that information can be very important. And if you can catch it early, you can prevent uh, many, many bad things from happening. Just last school year, uh, with the connection that I have with the staff and, and, and the trust that the students have in myself and the staff, we were able to take a weapon off of a kid that came, to, brought it into the school. And we were able to foil um, a massacre or, or you know, a dangerous situation because they trusted myself and the, and the administration to let us know that they had heard that someone had brought something into the school and we were able to recover it and get it out of here and take the kid into custody and, and keep the school safe. I feel like if Deputy Richmond wasn't there, that could have ended really badly and Deputy Richmond was there to stop that. I think the student went to Deputy Richmond because he knew that in the past he's been really involved with us and he knew that he would be able to trust Deputy Richmond because Deputy Richmond would do the right thing. And our, our school resource officers, um, their job doesn't stop when the, when the school day is over. They, they're they involved with after school activities and sporting events. They're role models, um, they're mentors, just informal counselors for kids who need help. Well, I worked with Deputy um, Sergeant Burgess at Rodney Thompson Middle School when I was an assistant principal there, and we started a girls club. So we worked on um, several different things together where we're building girls' um, motivation and self-worth and their opinions about themselves and others, and we coach them and we mentor them, and that's the partnership that really matters. The girls club. Um, the gifted, inspiring, resilient, lovable sisters. There's some girls in the community that I would go and pick up and, and we would go and I would take them to take them to different places. And a lot of law enforcement officers do this too, but there's families that are in need that I help out. Not removing them. The importance of them being there, the lasting impact of the relationships, of the, um, the impact they have on youth. I think there's a message there of how the SRO program can be utilized in a way that deters future issues. The thin blue line to me is being professional 
and um, representing um, law enforcement with the utmost ethical leadership, but at the same time making sure that, that we're protecting one another, not from doing something wrong. But when we talk about law enforcement, and, and sometimes people either misunderstand what the meaning is, they, they seem to think that law enforcement are gonna stick together, and if you do something wrong, I'm your brother, I've got your back, I'm gonna cover it up for you. That's not the case. What it means is I'm gonna be there to protect you and help you through either this life-threatening situation or I'm here to support you and us sticking together because there's so few of us. It's incumbent upon us to make sure that we do the very best job we can, but it, it takes, again, going back to teamwork. You know, you have, to, you have to trust one another. When I hear the phrase thin blue line, to me that means the ones who selflessly put themselves first to protect others. When I look at the thin blue line, it's nothing more than a symbol of, of the courage and the commitment that I have to wearing a badge and protecting the people in the community. The thin blue line means to me, I have a higher call in my life to serve people everywhere that I am because I'm representing what I am, and that's what's in my heart. You're gonna find the best cops, the best law enforcement officers. You're gonna find the best ones when they're a cop in their heart, and they haven't forgotten why they got into this. I have the flag in my garage, Jim. It represents our family of law enforcement. That's it. The thin blue line does not mean anything to me. I've never understood that thin blue line and I guess the only thing I ever heard about it was, you know, the negative negativity behind that connotation saying, you know, you don't cross that, you don't snitch, you don't do this, you don't tell all the police officers. Well, yes, I do. And I've done it because you're doing damage to what I hold dear. And I'm a very selfish person when I was in the Marine Corps and I had a uniform on and a Stafford County Sheriff's Officer's uniform on. I'm a very selfish person when it comes to the image that we portray. And I don't want people out there making the news unless it's something good. I don't want people out there, you know, hiding behind this blue line, this, this fake line they've created that says, we don't cross this because if we do, you're not part of us. You know, people look at it as a racist symbol now. They look at it as, um, you know, a, a gang. And, and to me, it's, <laughs> I'm like, you, it shows how uninformed they are. You know, they, they came out with the Blue Lives Matter and they came out with Black Lives Matter. And people say all lives matter. What I will not do is I will not align myself with bad police officers. So I don't associate with any of those groups, support, not support, whatever, who generalize everybody in a category because there are bad cops out there and I don't want them any more than anybody else does. There's this assumption, it doesn't matter what they do, they're gonna get away with it and all of them are conspiring together to protect the blue. When we take the opportunity to look at issues through the perspective of the other person, there's a level of understanding that we can grab. One bad choice done by one person, and now all of us as a whole have to pay for that. It's aggravating. You you only ever hear me say I back righteousness. I feel that a lot of people look at us as law enforcement officers and they think that just because we're all cops that we stand together over every little thing. That is not true. I can't tell you how many times I've looked on the, on, on the news or I've seen something that's happened. And as a black man, I'm thinking to myself or I'm sitting at the dinner table with my wife and my children and I'm saying that guy should have never had a badge. That guy never should have had a gun. That guy should have never put on that uniform because I cannot answer for what somebody else spoke. For every time I hear, you know, cops are bad or cops are targeting black people, I see it and I'm like, my voice will be heard. Not only my voice, but my actions. Whenever I come across someone who's a minority, whether they be Hispanic or black or whatever, and they're afraid, I take the time to engage that person as much as I can to change it, but when you focus on those one-on-one um, -on -one interactions, um, that's where you get rejuvenated, revived, and you're like, man, I made a difference in that one person's life. And so when I hear it from me, it's like the gloves are off and I'm ready to fight. You know, that's that's what, you know, these last four or five years have been. I was asking them in a the barbershop, I said, hey, in Stafford County, I've been here for 16 and a half years. 
how many people have we shot in Stafford County? I looked around the room and y'all looked at me like, oh, y'all ain't shot nobody. Really? I said, well, I know of three. I said, why don't you know about them? They said, we don't know. I said, because they weren't black men. If one of them had been a black man, we'd have made the news. But nobody cared about the white men whose lives were taken at the hands of the Stafford County Sheriff's Office. Because for me, I don't care whether you're a criminal or not. Um, the loss of life is tragic. I don't care whether it's justified or not. Um, it's someone's daughter, somebody's son. Um, life is precious. To not acknowledge the sacrifice that these officers have put in to make a change, to, to be positive, to make a difference, is really hard to deal with. And he's my dad. He's the first one to go out there and he's ready to just be the first and do the best that he can be. And it's just like you and me. The struggles of being a black man, I get it. It's not that I just see it, but I understand it. I feel it. But being in law enforcement, I now recognize that not every cop, no matter what color they are, does not meet that description of what media paints us to be. And that is also towards our black community as well. I think when we start grouping people, it says something about ourselves. If uh, you go to any gathering, people are gonna draw to the people they know. So part of our issue is, I don't wanna go out of my way to know anything about you. So if we blatantly say that all police officers are racist or that any group is racist, we already have an issue because you're grouping people. I don't know that there's anything that I could say that could reach the people that are rioting and the people that have made up their minds that all cops are bad. And I'm one of the most optimistic people you'll ever meet. Heads always in the clouds. I get made fun of for that. We've lived the same life, most of us, that of the, of the people in these communities that we're policing. So we have that connection. We speak the same language, so to speak. There was a Black officer in Charlotte, North Carolina, that had shot and killed a black man. The chapter president, I forgot his name, of the Charlotte, North Carolina NAACP chapter came on TV. He said that once you put on this uniform and once you put on this badge, you're no longer a black person. You have been institutionalized and brainwashed into the white community and we no longer accept you. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People just disowned me. The very institution who was created to make sure that we were all treated fairly and we all had a fair shot in life in whatever community, job that we wanted, just disowned me because of my career. But now you've just separated them from being Black. I don't understand how being a law enforcement officer strips me of my identity as a Black man. And all I've been hearing lately is Black Lives Matter. Do they? When they're wearing a badge and have a gun? All we've been hearing is Black Lives Matter. And I believe that. But is that true when that Black life is gunned down as a law enforcement officer? To be institutionalized to another way of thinking says that you're no longer a black man. How can you tell me who I am because I put a uniform on? How can you tell me who I'm not because I put a uniform on? How can you tell me that I've been institutionalized? Who are you to judge me? And who are you to tell me who I am? And that is also very insulting to, I would say, to white people. Because now you're telling me that I'm institutionalized to a, an aspect of people that you don't like because a black man was killed by the police. How does that make sense? Division, if it is not rectified and we bring unity, I fear that there'll be another civil war within our country. Uh, hate breeds hate. Division brings about animosity. I guess that's why I understand the protests with um, guys in blue. You know, their lives matter. They are putting their lives on the line and that's not to say that they're anybody better than anybody else. But on the other side, you have the people of color 
And I believe because we don't understand, we just simply try and express ourselves and you express your new sales to people who perhaps don't want to hear, now we got confrontation. And I think that's part of what's going on that I don't really hear you serving me, I hear you demeaning and putting me down if you were a person in, uh, of color. You know, we have Black Lives Matter protesting and we have Blue Lives Matter protesting. I'd like to see them come together because really we all believe the same thing. Nobody thinks that a bad law enforcement officer, regardless of their skin color, should wear the badge or the uniform. Seeing some of the things that, you know, that have happened with George Floyd and, and the last incident with Jacob Blake, those two incidents is like, we can look at them and, and I have to be honest, it's like, you know what, if it was a white person, it would have been handled totally different because it's like, how can we change this? I mean, what can be done? I'm the first person to tell you that I believe in the right to protest, but looting and burning and, and vandalizing and assaulting people um, is never okay. And so when you say something like that, you're gonna get pushed back. And in many cases, those are the individual that does not hear anyway. We kind of got things out of perspective. People who need to hear the message, perhaps we're never getting the message to them. I can tell you all day long your problem, but can I see my own? Racial injustice is a concern and we need to pay attention to that. And we need to make sure that um, racial injustice does not occur. We need to adhere to the Constitution of Virginia and the Constitution of the United States, making sure that everyone is treated fairly and just. The one thing that I'm very aware of about the officers, the minority officers, they have a great deal of respect for the sheriff. They love the guy. I know that they felt protected and safe within what was communicated from their direct leader. When I first viewed that video, it just put chills down my spine. I couldn't believe that someone wearing a uniform and having a badge of authority would mistreat another human being that way. It was hard for me to watch that. A few feelings that came up was sadness and then anger feeling bad for Mr. Floyd for what he went through. What would cause a person to mistreat someone like the way that uh, Mr. Floyd was mistreated? As word started spreading about protests that were being um, uh, scheduled, one of the things that was brought to my attention was that the people who were listed as coordinators were not people that we recognized. Vernon Green took the leadership role, helped facilitate and, and, and to keep things um, um, structured and, and to keep things peaceful and to give everyone an opportunity to, to share their concerns. It was important for me to let the community know that I care enough to be there with them and that it's authentic and that I wanna make sure that uh, they have a peace of mind of knowing that I'm gonna do, do everything in my power to make sure that um, no one is mistreated um, like George Floyd was mistreated. We had a lot of people, leaders out there and what started as a protest organized by somebody we did not know, in order to keep the peace, we took over the event. An absence of leadership take charge type of thing. We had a group of um, representatives from the local government and the business community to come out together in um, solidarity to address the people who were coming out uh, for, uh, for this rally protest. Because of my interaction within the community and because of my connection to the people, we were uniquely positioned to bring everybody to the table. They knew me, they knew what I stood for, they know that I'm trying to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And then because of my connection in with the people, we were able to bring them. Very important for you all to know that your sheriff's office cares about you, we love you. I know you don't hear that very often from law enforcement, but we, we do care deeply about you and we are here with you. Our constitution is very, very important. The fact that you're out here protesting and uh, expressing your beliefs and opinions are very important. And God bless you for doing it peacefully. We're called to serve and um, care for our community. I, I wanted to convey that and I also convey that I won't tolerate racism. I wanted to make sure that, that they knew where I stood and where um, my heart is and what they can expect from, from their law enforcement. We let the leaders speak and address the crowd. We let the crowd speak and address the leaders. They were happy about the leadership's response to what was going on. And it wind up being a, what we considered an effective and peaceful protest.
So the George Floyd incident just shook our country. And I thought um, it was important for me uh, to, to put a statement out, letting, uh, letting our community know that we'll never tolerate that here in Stafford. I consider us friends. Our partnership has value for the community. He let me read his release before he released it, just to see if there was anything there that he may have missed, anything offensive. To be very honest, in his message, there was nothing to change. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Uh, these are the words that come to mind as we contemplate a great injustice that rattled the nation over the past several days. Although the death of George Floyd took place hundreds of miles from Stafford County, the impact of this injustice has uh, reverberated across the nation, including here in our community. Alongside our community, we watched with horror the chilling video of the Minneapolis police officer kneeling on the neck of George Floyd for a prolonged period of time as he pleaded for help and yelled, I can't breathe. Several officers stood nearby doing nothing as George Floyd took his last breath and died at the hands of the officers who took an oath to protect and serve their communities. On the heels of such a grave injustice, we cannot do nothing. We cannot be silent. We or when most law enforcement officers wake up in the morning and put on their badge, they recognize the tremendous responsibility and honor of protecting and serving their communities. Each day, they pour their hearts and souls into serving their communities. Sometimes that means arresting criminals, but most of the time it means stopping to help an elderly resident change a tire or trying to tie a child's shoelace or using their own money to buy a football for a group of children who, who didn't have presents under the Christmas tree. When that officer kneeled on the neck of George Floyd and watched him take his last breath, he tarnished the badge and abdicated his duty to his community. And even worse, the killing of George Floyd has bled fear into the African-American community and incited concerns that every law enforcement officer is like the one who pinned George Floyd to the ground as he screamed for help. Today, we want to assure the community that racism, hate, and excessive use of force by law enforcement will find no home in Stafford County. We will not tolerate such a blatant disregard for human life and will work tirelessly to ensure the fair and impartial treatment of all residents, regardless of their ethnicity, race, sexual orientation, religion, age, or socioeconomic class. All our residents will be treated with dignity and respect. Our deputies have been and will continue to be instructed in the core values of the Stafford County Sheriff's Office, which are fairness, compassion, professionalism, and integrity. We will also continue to protect the rights and civil liberties of others by upholding the Constitution of Virginia and the United States. We will not fail our community. Our deepest condolences go out to George Floyd's family and friends. You will be in our thoughts and prayers in the days ahead. I felt in league or in, in communion with what his message was, that he did this on his own and represented the leadership that I sometimes feel is lacking in many areas. And the positive response um, from our community was overwhelming. They um, needed to hear where we were standing and what we felt, and they needed the reassurance. They needed to know that the uh, law enforcement organization that polices their community and takes care of um, their community is with them and is going to care for them and is going to make sure that uh, what happened to George Floyd would never happen here in Stafford. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. If I could say anything to the nation, 
concerning being a black man in law enforcement. It may sound weird, but I would say, let me tie my shoes. Because in law enforcement, those of us that come to work every day to protect and serve, we know why we're here. And we care deeply for every person that we encounter. But sometimes when someone is running, their shoes get untied. And if you keep running with your laces untied, you'll slip, you'll trip, and you'll fall. So if I could say anything to the world, it would be, or if I could say anything to the nation, it would be right now in law enforcement, we've tripped in some areas of our profession. For those of us that are here for the right reasons, give us a second so we can tie our shoes and run again.